Hey guys, Dr. Nate here at Thrive Dental, and this week was a little interesting. It was different because we had a group ask me to do a presentation and a Q&A session uh, with a dental shadower group. Tons of fun, I'm gonna post that here. Once again, if you have any questions or comments, please leave them below. And you can actually go check out their channel too. They have a bunch of cool um, dentists, orthodontists, periodontists, bunch of different specialists on there. And they do this like kind of Q&A with some presentation. That's really neat, really interesting. All right guys, I hope you enjoy this little dental shadowing video. Hello everyone and welcome back to another session with Dental Shadowers. Today we have a very exciting session with Dr. Nathan. Dr. Nathan, thank you so much for joining. And on that note, the floor is yours to take away. Awesome guys, so thank you so much. I hope the internet is gonna work because my internet is all sorts of messed up. I am using my iPhone to, to stream this right now. So hopefully everything goes okay. Um, but I'm gonna do a presentation. Mine, I think may be slightly different. I know you guys are with me, so I'm gonna actually probably be counting, I'm gonna be calling on you guys a little bit here to, uh, to answer some questions. Um, but mine will be a little bit different. I saw you guys just, I think it was, maybe last week had had Dr. Tao Nguyen on and she is amazing. She's a classmate of mine and her her like skill set when it comes to ortho and finishing cases and is amazing. Like I don't know if you can get that in, in her video, but she was always like the best. Like we were always competing with her to try to, to try to do good. And she always crushed us. Her her hand skills are are amazing. So that was never my, I'd say like my biggest skill set I knew that wasn't going to be my go-to thing so I like to do more like the I like to talk to people about how to get in the business side of it you know is it worth it to become an orthodontist you're going to be doing all these kind of things to try to kind of figure out if this is actually going to be worth it for you guys you guys are going to spend a ton of money and a ton of time uh, hopefully to become dentist orthodontist whatever the heck you guys want to become so you want to know and, and make sure it's actually worthwhile so that is what I'm going to be going through. And of course, at the end, I'll go through some cases as well, just to get that in as well. So let me give you a little background. I like to give this background because I think everybody comes from such different backgrounds and it's really interesting. So for me, it was definitely a little bit different. I am Canadian born and raised, so I'm a foreign grad technically. And my story is a little bit different. I, I like to tell this because it gives you kind of insight and how some things can affect your life and they affect you forever. And hopefully it's in a good, good way. So as you guys probably know, you guys are probably studying for the DAT or you're studying hard in your classes. And for us, when we were getting in, I'm assuming it's the same thing for you guys. But when you're getting in, the DAT is like everything. You know, you have to do well in the DAT in order to basically get into dental school. And in Canada, it is a little bit different. Canada is super strict. <laughs> So for us, we took the DAT, I think I took it in November, October, or whenever it was. But for us, we had to carve a bar of soap. And so this is a little bit different. In, in the States, it's different. You're just doing like all this stuff online, the A's and B's and C's and all that stuff. In Canada, it's different. You have a bar of soap that's like yay big-ish. And you have to carve like a square or like a triangle or something into that bar of soap and then hand it in. But in Canada, it is super, super, super competitive. So if you mess up on like one thing, you're done for. So I'm going through the test and I'm looking at the numbers and everything's like, oh, you have to do a line here that's 16 millimeters, another line that's like 20 millimeters, another line that's like, you know, whatever, 16. And if you mess up a little bit, you are basically screwed. So I, I did it. I thought everything went really well. After that part was done, I then, everybody kind of takes a break. And as you take the break, everybody remembers all the numbers, you're talking about the numbers and they say like, oh yeah, that, that line there was supposed to be 16 millimeters. And I'm like, 16 millimeters, man, I did 26. I messed up on like the very first number. So I was like, oh man, as soon as I did that, my heart, like you can guys you can imagine, I'm sure if you guys have taken the DDT, you imagine like if that happens to you, your heart just like sinks, you like, you like die inside. Like all that hard work and then you all, mess up. Like, <laughs> all that hard work is like done, it's like it's, it's done. So then I, I realized, hey, I'm screwed. I obviously go through the rest of the test, get the results back. Everything's good, minus that part. So the Canadian schools, um, oh yeah, so I was able to take it again. But in Canada, you can only take the DAT every six months. And if you're applying for school, you know that you want to apply early. Like you want to apply in like July, August or whatever you're applying in. 
but I get my grades back, I think in November. So I'm already kind of late. I knew I was screwed. So I didn't actually get to take the test. I think it was October-ish or sorry, um, January, February-ish. And I get my results back in March. So I took the test a second time, did well, but then I hit up the Canadian schools. I'm like, hey, everything's good. Like, here's my second grade. Everything's good. And they're like, no, no, no. We're only going to take the first grade, not the second one. And you're going to have to wait a full year in order to get in. So very, very last minute, probably, I think it was, it was like March, April, when pretty much most of the class is already full. I applied to USC and I applied to BU. And at the, I went to both of them. I just quickly got interviews and like last second, I picked USC and I swear I was, I think the last, the last dental student that was picked. But I often tell people that story because, you know, we can have one thing in our life that we think is like the worst. I thought at that point, like that was one of the worst things that can happen to me, at least academically, that was probably one of the worst things, but that turned out to be honestly the best thing in my life because I, I love Canada, but I left Canada. I went to LA, so Los Angeles is a beautiful city. I was there for dental and ortho. I met my wife who's in the back somewhere, met her there. And so that one, literally that five seconds, the 10 seconds that I took to look at that test, um, the numbers there totally changed my life forever. So you can have something in your life that, you know, you may think is just the worst. Like you mess up on the DAT, you mess up on this exam, you mess up on something. But that one thing may change your life in a very positive direction. It's hard to see that at the time, but obviously looking back is a huge thing. So that, that's a little bit of my background. I, as I mentioned, I went to USC with Tao Nguyen, who was on here just a little bit ago, and a couple other amazing uh, people. And now we moved to Dallas. And um, I like to talk about this a little bit as well, because we've kind of moved a little bit all over the place in order, well, I guess I'd move all over the place in order to kind of further my life. And I think that's something that people have trouble with. You know, if you are born in a city, you like to stay there because you feel comfortable, you've gone to school there, families there, friends are there, and it is tough sometimes to leave. But I think in the end, if you leave and you can kind of spread your wings and fly, then I think you can really, um, you know, help yourself and help your future family kind of grow uh, the max amount. And then I'm going to go into this a little bit. I think I'll go into it in a little bit. I like to talk about the different aspects of ortho or dentistry because I've been in um, an office where it's owned, you know, the owners have like 200 or 300 different offices kind of called uh, Western Dental. I've been in smaller offices and now we have seven of our own offices. So I've been able to see all the different transitions. I can tell you what's good with corporate. I can tell you what's good with your own office. And there's a lot of differences between that. I can also tell you a little bit about dentistry because my wife is a dentist. And um, so I can talk to you a little bit about that. But that's a little bit of my background. Okay, I'm gonna move this thing in here. So I'm assuming some of the other orthodontists have probably talked to you about this, but what is an orthodontist? And, and I'd be, I'm surprised all the time how so few people actually know what an orthodontist is. So as far as ortho, I'm assuming you guys know, we basically just do braces, Invisalign, maybe some lingual braces, but anything that's kind of moving teeth. And then there's a difference between board certified and a non-board certified, I would say regular dentist or regular orthodontist. So board certified, we had a big push when we were at USC. I think most of us or like 80 or 90% of us became board certified. And all that meant was that we, um, after our schooling was done, we took all of our cases and made them all pretty and nice and, and, and as basically as beautiful as we possibly could, and then gave them to um, a kind of a grading committee. And then we had to go in there, it's in St. Louis, and take this test and make sure we knew what we were talking about. And then you become board certified. So I think that was really important at the time. I don't know how honestly how beneficial all that stuff is now because there's basically so few people who ever ask me if I'm board certified in probably the well, definitely thousands of patients I've seen, maybe three <laughs> have asked me about board certification. So it's super, super low, but it's definitely something nice to have kind of on your belt. And so that you can, you can say you're board certified orthodontist. Does it allow you to do like other procedures or that isn't? No, so it doesn't, it doesn't really affect anything. Like, so as far as being able to do other procedures, as far as getting a new job, as far as really like, anything it doesn't maybe it's good marketing you know when uh, mom or dad or 
whoever are looking at your website like, oh, he's board certified. 100%. But as far as able to do different things, have different privileges, it honestly doesn't mean anything. I know for some specialties like pedo, um, maybe there's some other ones where having that certification allows them to go in the hospital. But ortho, it's like we're just, you know, putting on braces. We don't need to, we don't need to have any like special designations. So yeah, it didn't help us too much. Um, okay, so he said you're going to be. I I didn't realize this is going to be me and you. So I'm going to ask you some questions. So why why do you want to become a dentist or an orthodontist or whatever you want to become? Well, essentially, my goal is just to serve people. And um, I really like I delved deep into dentistry when I when I found a job at the start of the pandemic with a prosthodontist in which he allowed me to work in his lab. And that's when I really like that was my first time actually like seeing what dentistry was all about in in like first ten. And, you know, I just love the way he interacts with his patients. And that's something that I want to do in my future. And that's why I'm currently still shadowing and, you know, making sure this is the right field for me. I mean, you have you have your answer down fact. That's really, really good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, so you're lucky, you know, you, you were able to shadow under pros. Pros are like, I mean, those are like the tip of the iceberg. They're, they're re it's really, really hard to become prosthodontist. And the cases most of them are doing are very complicated cases. I have to very say. complicated, like super, super, super. And they deal with a lot of cancer patients, I have to say, too. Yeah, that's tough. Like all that type of stuff, whenever you're dealing with like, you know, vertical dimension and like all these different, you know, making sure that the plant, like it, there's a lot of that goes into it and very, very few people can do it. And it's, it's a, yeah, it's very tough. And you're dealing with tough patients and it's great. But I think it's, I think it's important to, and you have it down really well. So that's amazing. I've definitely asked other people and they're just like, yeah, like I really don't know. You know, that's going to be, <laughs> that's going to be like, that's going to be like question one, like the very first question they're going to ask you into down, like in down school. Yeah. Why do you want to be, that's, that's the most important question. Most important question. So that's good that yours is unique. So it helps you stand apart, honestly, from other people because you're like, hey, I went saw Pross. I really enjoyed it. Like this is what he was doing. See, these are some cool cases. He was dealing with cancer patients, all this, all this stuff. That's really going to set you apart. But it's also important just like in your soul <laughs> to know why you want to do this because I never sugarcoat it. Becoming a dentist and becoming an orthodontist is freaking hard. It's hard work. I just got this um, message on, on Instagram like a couple days ago and they're like, oh, you look like you have a lot of practices. You're having fun. Everything looks cool. Like, is your life super easy? And I was like, hell no my life. <laughs> it's like the opposite it's super it's it's tough but the thing is i don't want my life like i honestly would be bored if i was like okay just have like i'm working at a job nine to five and clock in clock out like it, it'd be terrible i think and, and you mentioned this too i think it's super rewarding you know you're going in there you're changing people's lives for me i'm giving them a good smile I'm giving them confidence you know if um have you had braces or invisalign or anything before yeah i have had braces when i was younger yeah so, you know, I mean, if you can, you can probably remember this too. Like for me, I had braces actually when I was in dental school. So the difference between when I had janky teeth <laughs> versus a nice smile is, is different. Like you just feel so much more. Oh confident. yeah. Your, your confidence just goes through the roof. roof. Right. And you get that feeling like, oh, cool. Like this is an amazing feeling we get to give. Like every day I get to take off braces and put on braces and I get to see like the smile and the excitement in the in everybody's faces like it's such a it's such a rewarding experience and, and not only do you guys like improve their confidence but you also improve their quality of life which is Absolutely. also just as important Absolutely. yeah the, the the first thing that people see is like oh they have a straight straight smile straight teeth or whatever but you don't realize like oh obviously their oral health is gonna be better because it can brush floss and do all that stuff better you know this their biting their occlusion is gonna be better like all this stuff that like the geek out stuff is is kind of behind the scenes so yeah you're doing all these big transformations and yeah it's not easy um, you know, very few get into dental school, then you know, fewer get into specialty. But if you really want it, you're going to do it. And there's lots of different ways to do it. And it's super rewarding after. Um, so yeah, so like people always ask me this stuff, especially because I do a little bit of this stuff on YouTube. So I'm getting a ton of these questions like, hey, what courses should I take? Um, keep in mind, I'm not an administrator, so I don't have the behind the scenes. But when, um, when I was in ortho, and, and Dr. Nguyen can attest to this, you get to interview the incoming class and you get to see the behind the scenes. So when we got into dental, when I got into ortho, um, yeah, you don't really know, you're just kind of going through the steps. You're like thinking you, you can kind of weasel your way in a little bit. But then when you're in ortho, you get to interview the incoming class 
and you get to like be behind the scenes like hey why are we choosing this guy is it because they're grades is it because they're um you know extracurriculars what is it so i get to i got to see the behind the scenes and that's why i mentioned this stuff because you know we have a little bit more access to that information albeit that was over 10 years ago but i'm sure a lot of the same stuff applies um so the exact courses i don't think seem to matter it doesn't really seem to matter you want to get the best kind of gpa you can get mine like i said mine was good was not like the most amazing ever dat obviously matters you got to be definitely above average i think extracurriculars makes, makes a huge difference if you have if you're playing sports if you're volunteering if you have if you work with a prosthodontist all that all that stuff i think matters but this is something that i believe some people understand this but i understand this more and more as i get more experience in my career but who you know matters like just so much so much if you can get in like you guys are doing this this is amazing this is gives you guys lots of access to people if you can get in with an administrator you can get in with this some faculty anybody you can talk to to get in with and you don't want to schmooze and be like weird about it but if you can find something you relate on whether it's you know you're in cross you're helping them out or if you can just like relate on anything um it really 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 helps we had um, a few people get into ortho that their grades were definitely not top of the class. And typically when you think ortho, you think like, you know, it was hard to get into dental school. And then to get ortho, you're going to be in like the top 5% or whatever you are. But there's definitely some people who did not get in because of their grades. And it was because who they know or who they knew and their interaction with them. So I really like, I harp on this stuff a lot because People don't always want to kind of go out of their way to talk to the people and to interact, but that stuff is so important. Like this is, it's just so important. Um, yes, yeah, so I mean, all, all that stuff kind of happens or helps. But this, I like, I think is always interesting. Have you guys went into like, how do you pay for school and, and all that? Isa? Um, like not, not many doctors uh, talk about it, to be honest. Yeah, okay. And this is interesting because especially now, it is so important to know this stuff before you go in. Like, it's so important. Yeah, because I have no idea, like, of anything about loans. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, this is a good question. How much, okay, um, what what would be your top couple schools you're applying to? You would be applying to? Well, uh, I live in Florida, so there's uh, UF Dental School, there's LeeCom, there's Nova. Yeah. Nova. Probably somewhere in Texas, because I have some family there. Nice. Nice. So I think Texas and Florida is, like, my top, too. Those are great because I those probably well Nova might be a little bit more expensive, but yeah, Nova is definitely expensive. Yeah, it's so, private school. Yeah, um, it's great school. But um, I'll give you an example of how it was for us, and it's gone up since then. I think you can, on average, think about paying. This is at USC, which USC, uh, University of Southern California in LA, and NYU, and there's like UOP. There's a couple of schools that are just like stupid expensive. <laughs> um, so USC can expect to pay roughly a hundred grand per year um, that you're in school. That means your four years of dental and then your three years of ortho. So I knew multiple people getting out of ortho who are having seven hundred to nine hundred thousand dollars in debt, and that is insane. <laughs> that and is ortho is also, I'm assuming, maybe a hundred a year as well. That's what I'm saying. So. Um, Either if you're doing ortho, I know we have a lot of pedo friends, like pediatric dentist friends and orthodontist friends. And if you're taking full loans throughout and you're going to these schools, it's pretty normal to have 700, 800 ish um, in debt. And now I'm sure if you did that same route, I'm sure it's more like 800, 900 in debt. And it's going to be a million very soon. You know, like a mm -hmm. million dollars in loans, you have to, <laughs> you they don't really properly totally inform you of how this all works. And that's why I like to talk about it because I still, after all of that, I still think it's a good deal, but you really have to be aware of that because some people see this, this debt as they get into it and start to freak out. But it's and an investment at the end of the day. To be, yeah, absolutely, absolutely investment. Um, there has been some like super new developments, which is interesting, the IBR and the income-based repayment. I think what they're gonna do, so basically what happens is, you go to USC, you go to wherever you're gonna go, Nova, and they go, oh, cool, okay, we're gonna give you some loans. You're gonna get private loans, you're gonna get federal loans, you're gonna get all these different things, and then um, we're gonna kind of figure it out at the end and you'll pay it off and <laughs> you'll be fine. But what happens is if you're in you know certain areas, you're not your income won't be enough, it legit won't be enough. And I know you know teachers go through this too when they get, you know, their loans are smaller, but they get you know 20, 30, 40, 50 thousand dollar loans. 
and they can't pay it back. And that same thing happens with dentistry and ortho and, and all this. So it's not just like a you know, teacher thing or some other thing, it happens. But how they do it is you will get different programs, especially if it's federal, you can get stuff called income-based repayment or there's like repayee, there's all these different programs that help you um, pay back your loans. The good thing with this, the good thing that's happened kind of recently is that it, sh it typically was, hey, you would pay maybe 10 to 15% of your, of however much you're making and that goes straight to your loans. It like keeps going, keeps going, keeps going. And then at the end of like say 20 years or so, they would say, okay, the amount that you owe is now forgiven, but you have to pay um, taxes on that forgiveness. So say people had those $800,000 loans, they were, they were never getting the principal down. The principal never stayed. So by the time that they're done, they still owe probably roughly 800,000 or maybe more. And then they go, cool, that whole amount is forgiven, but you have to pay taxes. It's almost like the government's giving you a gift. So you'd have to pay like three or $400,000 in taxes, which is basically like another loan. So, but recently, I don't know if this is gonna stay, but they are saying that they're gonna forgive that full amount. So like once you're done with your 20 years, you're forgiven full on, which would be a huge, huge thing. So if that actually stays in effect and actually works, then that's gonna be a big, big thing. So that will help, I mean, all you guys um, to actually pay for this and make it worthwhile. So some food for thought there. So how much do you make? And I know definitely a lot of people don't talk about this. I did actually like a YouTube video on this and it, it, it's a weird topic because you have to talk about money and how much you're making and it's not super comfortable. So I don't get into like super specifics, but I do think it's important to know because like, like you're mentioning and we're talking about if your loan is gonna be a million dollars, you wanna be making good money or else it's this like literally that doesn't make sense. So the average orthodontist makes anywhere between 150 to 300,000. And this is like a huge range because it depends on how much you work, where you're working, um, if you own your own office, how many patients you're seeing, you know, there's a huge variability. Obviously the more offices um, that you're doing, the more successful they are, the more you're gonna make. But I'd say that's pretty average salary for somebody coming out of school. The average salary, same thing for coming out of school for a dentist is probably 80,000 to 20,000. Huge range because some people are working like three days a week. Some people, I work six days a week for the first, um, I think like two or three years out of school. I mean, I still work a ton. I know somebody who actually just had dinner with a couple weeks ago, or the non she's very successful. She still works six days a week and has been for like eight or nine years. So only gets the Sunday off. <laughs> only takes. Oh my God. And she, she um, lives in Dallas and travels to Houston, which is like even crazier. It's, it's, yeah, anyway, so you can work as much as you want and you can do as, as well as you want, but just know like obviously if you do things, you can set yourself up for success a little bit better and make yourself more financially kind of successful. Um, you know, if you have offices and if you know what you're doing business wise, but I really think a, a, a pitfall of dentistry and ortho is they don't talk to you about business. Like, are you, do you, have you taken any business classes or no? I have not, no. Anything I've learned is probably from, you know, you guys from these sessions or just like YouTube videos. Yeah, I, I think if you could, having taking um, a business, like I took one econ class, I think, but taking business classes is so important. Like, I think if I could do it again, I would have taken some, I would have like thrown away some of those crap. Like I took like a dinosaur course. <laughs> like, like, <laughs> I probably just to get those credits. Yeah, exactly. Because you think you're going to do well, but I would, I would probably put those to the side and taking business classes because they don't teach you that in business or in, in dental school. And honestly, if you come out, there's a lot of people that come out of school and want to start their own business right away. But you know, like this much about business, like you don't know anything. And so if you had a little bit of a foundation, I think it would make it better. In ortho, they talk to us about business and marketing. And you kind of get your feet wet a little bit. But honestly, the more you can know about business, the better. People hate this, but you, you really know, like we're selling all the time. I know, like especially new grads, they don't like that word, like, oh, selling, like you're selling all this like treatment. But that is what dentistry is. You're selling health. You're selling, you know, a brand new smile. You're, you're selling these things. So you need to kind of get in that mindset of, Oh, I need to kind of sell and, and, and do these things. So I'm going to be like financially successful in the end. Cause if you don't ever get your head around that, you feel like kind of icky, you know, it's like, Oh, I don't want to be selling this treatment. Like this doesn't feel good. But in the end, like we all are doing that. Um, so yeah, if I had one thing I could do and if I could go back, I would definitely take more business classes.
All right, this one I think is interesting. So it's like, should I become an orthodontist? <laughs> this is probably like on my YouTube channel, this is probably one of the, yeah, one of the top questions people ask like, hey, is it even worth it anymore? Because, and I'll have a lot, of, like a lot of ortho friends or people going into ortho. Actually, I, I know a grad, new grad that's going to graduate in a couple of months. And that was her big thing. Like, is this worth it? Like, is going to become an orthodontist worth it? And there's competition like Small Direct Club. Do they they their budget? I think is like probably like fifty million dollars for marketing, you know. And, and there's Candid, which is another like direct consumer. You have these huge loans. You might have a million dollar loan. Like, is this worth it? Like, can you? It's just so competitive. Dentists are doing braces. Is this worth it? And my response to this now, hopefully, it won't change in the future. But my response to this is that um, I think these big clubs like Small Direct Club, Candid, these other companies, I think this is actually good for ortho. The reason is, is that there's a ton of people who would not have been exposed to braces in the past that are now coming in because they see Invisalign, they see Candid, they see Small Direct, and they go, cool, that, that seems interesting, but eh, I don't like trust my mouth to like some random tech who's going to scan me. I'm never going to talk to an orthodontist. They want something a little bit more, um, yeah, they want to have that. Like in person. Something in person. Yeah, they want to be able to talk to you. So I think that now we get a lot of patients coming in actually that you had small direct and they didn't like it. And then they're coming to us and now they want braces or Invisalign or something along those lines. So I think that stuff helps. And that is even more reason why I think that is it's still a great time to become an orthodontist. Um, I'll give you an example. Right now we're looking for more associates. We already have two, I already have two another orthodontists that are working with me. Uh, we're looking for another one and it is hard it is very very hard there's just not that many out there because like there's such um there's a need for ortho right now which seems kind of crazy because all you hear about is like everything's so competitive but there is a need for ortho who knows i may change in five years ten years but as of right now i think it's like a great time um great time to, to become an orthodontist and especially they're giving all these like these loans that will be forgiven that even makes it better all right let's get into the cases so you said you it's just me and you so we're gonna we're gonna do some things here <laughs> hopefully okay. i picked the right answer pick the right answer okay so we have this girl here um this is a this is pretty tough case because she has a pretty big underbite um do you think we can fix this with just braces um i think so yeah yes maybe maybe the left side yeah so this is hard because you can see my mouse, yeah? Yeah, I can see your mouse. Okay. So this is her midline on the bottom and this is her midline on the top. So this is actually a really hard case. Like this is tough, but her face looks pretty good. So this is one of them like in surgery cases are no joke. If somebody wants a surgery, like they're gonna be in the hospital for, you know, for like, you know, for a couple of days and this recovery is crazy. So very, very, very few people want surgery. So we just were able to correct this with just um, just actually some rubber bands. It actually didn't take that long. I think it's like 18 months or so. The disadvantage of doing this is, uh, look, everything's on, everything looks pretty. The disadvantage of doing this is her upper teeth have to get protruded in order to have a little bit of a, a good bite. Right. So that's the disadvantage of doing this without surgery. But honestly, I, I wouldn't want surgery. I had a, I have a crossbite in my back and the ortho was like, yeah, you might need surgery. I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm not getting surgery. So <laughs> getting surgery is, is tough. So I try to do everything I can to prevent it. So this is an example of- So essentially you just move, you moved it through uh, rubber bands or midline. Rubber bands, all it is. Just and how, long does, how, does, how long does that usually take? Yeah, so this one, I believe her case was like 18 months. Because she wasn't that crowded, it wasn't that hard. And she did an amazing job of rubber bands. To be honest, this is like, we did this maybe like three years ago, so I can't remember the exact of it. But um, yeah, it wasn't long. She was great. She was awesome. Yeah. So this one is interesting. This is a tough one, too. So a lot of people would say this is potentially a surgery case again. And we have some associates who would probably say this is a surgery case again because of the open bite. Open bite, right. Yeah, exactly. Super tough case. He has, um, it's hard to see here, but he has a lot of like a root exposure. And he went to another orthodontist and it's basically the orthodontist is like, hey, if we try to close this bite without doing like these special mechanics and surgery and yada, yada, like your teeth are going to fall out. No joke. They said your teeth are going to fall out. He's a really nice guy. We got to know each other really well. And I was like, I promise you, your teeth will hopefully not fall out. 
<laughs> but let's do this. So we corrected, and unfortunately, these next pictures aren't amazing, and he has a lot of staining, which kind of sucks. But we will we will able to get the bite together without surgery. So it's the same thing with just rubber bands. If patients wear the rubber bands really, really well, then you're able to get like these crazy results with just rubber bands. And these are adult patients. Adult patients are actually the hardest. Um, yeah, so it helps a lot. Unfortunately, he has staining all over the place. I think he's a smoker and a caffeine drinker. So. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> really nice guy though. Um, okay, so this is an interesting one. Let's see. Okay, this is that. If you get this, you get bonus points. Do you notice anything unusual? I'll tell. I'll show you. It's. Do you know, notice anything unusual about this picture or this picture? Well, I can see here lateral lateral incisal is uh, not in correct place, and then this is tough. Let's see. I'll, I'll give you like another like ten seconds or so. <laughs> do you, do you is there something with the palate? No. So is there or the gum? Is there anything missing on one side? <laughs> okay. I'll, I, mean, I don't think anybody's got this when I've, when I've asked. It. I can't. See, I know I can't. I can't. I can't really notice. So on this side, she has one um, premolar. Oh, I should have counted that. <laughs> <laughs> and same thing. Same thing goes on this side. So she's she's very like asymmetric and. It's hard because I don't have the picture of like, sometimes we have a picture of them smiling and you'll see how asymmetrical she was. So we had to take out basically the same on the other side. I think they took it out because she was crowded. The dentist just took it out, not thinking like future. Um, but then we end up taking out another premolar on each side then everything lines up really nice and pretty. This is a really interesting case too, because she is pretty quick. It was like 14 months or 15 months is it pretty quick, but we needed to finish her because literally the day we finished her, she like, you know, whitened her teeth and then took off for her wedding and like had her wedding like like the next day or something. It was really it was really crazy. But she was super excited. She was she was awesome. So I, I, I yeah I only had a few cases. I know we're basically at the hour mark right now. Um, and I like I I'm like a big quote person. I, I like I follow all these people. But the biggest thing is I say why live in an ordinary life when you can live an extraordinary one because. We're only here once. We got to do it big. We got to do as much as we can. You cannot let fear ever take over. You always have to push the envelope just a little bit, just a little bit, just so you can experience. Hundred yeah. percent. I like that. And that's it, man. That's easy peasy. Doctor Nathan, it was a pleasure. Thank you so much. Uh, Dia here is going to answer some, or she's going to read out some questions from our YouTube chat. If that's okay with you, of course. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Awesome. Let me turn on this light so I can see. But yeah, Dia, go for it. Yeah. Let me grab it. Okay. So, so the first question we have is: Did you think about coming to back after back to Canada after going to USC? And what were your pros and cons in staying in the US? Absolutely. So my original thing was, I wish I could. It's I wish I could see people so I could be like, hey. But yeah, there's a lot of people that move away from home for sure. You know, when um, they're going to school. And so my original thought was go to USC, like, I'm going to be there for four years, bounce back to Canada, like, live my life, it's going to be amazing. But obviously, like everybody, there's wrinkles, not wrinkles, there's things that happen in life that change what your perspective is. So I met my wife, and when I was in my third year, obviously, she was not my wife at the time, but I met her at that point. And then I knew, I always knew I wanted to do ortho, but honestly, I thought it was too hard. Like, I was just like, dude, this is too hard. I'm not smart enough. I'm not good enough. Like, I can't do this. But then after taking a couple of tests, I was like, oh, this is like, this is a possibility. And then once I knew I could do it, um, I knew that I was probably going to stay in the States. And I miss, and honestly, I miss friends in Canada. Absolutely. Especially during the pandemic. This is like the worst because normally I go home like a couple of times a year. Um, I'm pretty sure that's going to hopefully change soon. But um, so, yeah, originally I did think I was going to go home and then things happen. And like, I'm honestly so grateful. Like life has been amazing. I'm just like very, very blessed. So you never know what's going to happen. Just let whatever comes, just let it be. Dr. Nathan, um, some people in the chat, they're a little confused from, I think, the third case. So you said you took out a tooth from the other side. Um, did you add another tooth or uh, did you like fix it for some you know, um, procedure yeah. with braces? <laughs> On the, I don't even know how to go back to this thing, but oh, it's easy enough. <laughs> so on this one, she, we took out, teeth on the opposite side. So 
she had, she was missing two teeth up here as a left or right side. She's missing two premolars on this side previously. So we basically just took out the two on the opposite side and were able to shift everything over. And how exactly do you shift through rubber bands as well? Yeah, exactly. So basically you'll just kind of pull back one tooth at a time with different rubber bands and different braces and just like different kind of we call them power chains. Um, and then we kind of like to retract it. So then we get the midlines on and then we kind of close everything up. But yeah, it's, it's nothing crazy. I didn't use... Um, you know, a lot of people will use like I'm heard of TADs, like temporary anchor, like mini implants or different devices. I literally almost never use anything crazy. Like I I used TADs when I was in school at <laughs> USC. Other than that, I haven't because I just feel like the majority of the stuff you can accomplish without it. There's all these like crazy things. Like I I don't use headgear. I've never used headgear. I think headgear is like hopefully back in the day. <laughs> no, I think I think headgear is actually like. A, it should not ever be used because there's there's so many breathe issues. Like there's just so many issues. I think that headgear is, I, I just, I'm really, really against headgear. And I'm, like, if you go to school in ortho, everybody's like, there's all this staff or the faculty are pro headgear. And I was always like, this doesn't make sense to me because you're, what you're trying to do is you're trying to hold back the maxilla and let the mandible come forward. Whereas in, I think it's like 90% of the cases when you have, an, an overbite where the top teeth or the um, overjet where the top teeth stick out too much, it's a mandible issue. So you want to advance the mandible. And there's, if you guys are interested, there's always like these breathe thing that's coming out right now. And like breath and breathing is so important. Sleep apnea, all this stuff is so important. It relates to like mental function, all these functions. So I really think like different types of headgear is like the worst. And I have, I have friends that use them still. I, I'm always like, that is terrible. That's terrible. Um, but anyway, <laughs> to answer that question, no. Wait, wait, how would you go about that? I know you were saying the mandible. How would you go about shifting that like forward? Yeah, so there's lots, there's tons of appliances that shift forward. People um, may have had these, but there's stuff called like a Herbst appliance, where it just brings the mandible forward. It's like these little kind of springs inside the mouth. There's a Mara appliance, which kind of does a similar thing. There's forces, there's a bunch of different appliances that go in the mouth um, that help bring the mandible forward, especially when you're growing. It's really easy. Like especially when you're growing, it's super easy. Um, but yeah, this retruding the maxilla, this, yeah, I, I think it's, I think it's like <laughs> very bad. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so the next question is, what is it like managing seven offices? Is it a headache managing that many? <laughs> I feel like the same person asked me. Like, oh, yeah. <laughs> no, it's another person, <laughs> but... Um, <laughs> managing, okay, so managing seven office is, is super easy. Life is easy. That's it. No, I'm just joking. It's, it's, really, it's, really, it's really hard. It's really hard because you're trying to manage people and you're trying to manage egos. You're trying to manage like dentists, orthodontists, all this stuff. But it's not like it's me, you know, managing everything. You know, I have um, my wife who does a lot of the stuff. I have, we have lots of staff who are amazing. We have one amazing team member who has been with us since day one. And um, she is a regional manager. So she makes sure like everything's kind of in its place. The hard thing is managing and also working. If I was just managing, it'd be easy. If I was just working, it'd be easy. But managing and working is really tough because today I saw like 60 some patients. We had nine ortho starts, super busy day. And there's, you know, six or seven other offices like going doing their thing that they need me to answer some questions. So that's when it's tough. But would I have it any other way? No chance. Like we're going to open lots more offices and we're going to keep going. Um, but yeah, is it easy? Is it stressful? Absolutely. Is it rewarding? Absolutely. Do you love it? Absolutely. Wait, so do you, do you run all the offices or you have like associates who help you out? Oh yeah, we have associates. Yeah, okay, yeah. yeah I was going to say, <laughs> I was like, man, this guy's a machine. At one office and 20 minutes at the other office. <laughs> uh, no, yes, yeah, so we have associates. So we have, um, I don't even know. So I know we have we have three orthodontic associates and we have, um, there's like seven dentists with us or something like that, and lots of staff. So yeah, we have lots of people. We have some, we have a partner on, on two of them. So it's like, it's kind of like, yeah, we have help, but um, yeah, but it's a lot of work, but no, I'm, I'm definitely not the orthodontist at all the offices. I'm actually gonna be the orthodontist at fewer offices very soon, just because yeah, doing orthodontics and managing is basically impossible, pretty much impossible. <laughs> yeah, awesome. it seems very hard. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, the next question is, how do you guys get out of a slump or prevent burnout? I think- Oh, 
That's actually a good, that's a really interesting one because that happens a lot. So um, number one, and this is why I was talking to Issa earlier that you need to like, want to be doing this. That's number one, because anybody who tells you this stuff is easy is like they're bold faced lying to you because it's not, it's really hard day in, day out. If you own an office, like if you probably talk to other dentists or dentists who own offices, it's not like, oh, I'm clocking in at uh, like eight and then clocking out at five. It's like, I'm always on like every single day, like there's always something happening. So it's easy to get burned out, but you need, for me, like my biggest thing is I love, I love what I do. And then honestly, if I start to think like, eh, this maybe is not exactly what I want to do, uh, we shift focus a little bit. So for me, I love ortho, but I love managing probably more. And so I realized that and it's taken some time for me to realize that, but that means, hey, I need to get some offices so I can do managing more and maybe ortho a little bit less. I always want to do some ortho, but I love the managing part. I love the growing part. So that helps me like to, to kind of shift my strategy and shift what I'm going for. But then also we're very, very blessed and we're lucky enough that, you know, I can, we can just take time off and go. Like we just went last weekend to Charleston um, just for a vacation, just to relax and just like to totally cut off in the mind. We go to conferences all the time, not dental related. But most of the time we don't go to very many dental related stuff, we go to other stuff just to kind of meet new people, relax, take, you know, take time away from dentistry. Um, because I really think that's true. There's so many people that get really, really burnt out with dentistry. It's easy with school. Like you guys, that's, you guys are probably in the toughest spot right now. It's easy to get burned out, but you have to have like a good support network. And then every so often, just take a break, but you can't take too much of a break if you want to keep, <laughs> keep progressing. But that it's tough. There's no like one right thing. But for us, it's, it's loving what I do, changing my focus every so often, and then taking a break at least once a quarter for me. I have a question because this is something that just like always confused me. Um, orthodontists are always saying like they see like 50, 60 patients in, the sing in, in that single day. And I'm like, wow, that's crazy. How do you guys have time to you know, plan for patients? Is that something you do like off time, like at the house or? I don't take my work home. I don't think I've really ever taken my, like as far as that work, I don't take it home. I know people do like more old school ortho, maybe some newer people, they, they take casts and they bring them home and do all that stuff. For me, it's basically like, I think once you, I've seen so many patients, like I've only been, excuse me, in orthodon since 2013. I've only been like doing braces since 2011, right through school. So I've been doing this for like 10 years ish or so or whatever. But you really, it's so fast. Like I can literally look at a case, like a new consult, look in her mouth. I'm probably legitimately that fast and know what we're going to do. Because you've seen the same thing over and over. And that's true. You're seeing 50, 60, 70 patients a day. Think about doing that every day, six days a week for like three some years. And then still doing it for like four or five days a week for another seven years. Like you see it just so much. There's it becomes like mental, me mental memory. Literally, it's just like, oh yeah, cool. And then what I have to do is I actually have to stop because I don't want to go too fast because patients are kind of like, whoa, like, like what, what's going on? Like, you, did you look? And I'm like, yeah, I look, I what's going on. But like, I'll slow it down and like explain and stuff because you just don't want to rush through it. So um, yeah, you don't need that much time. And then keep in mind, you are not the one. And this is what's really, really different with ortho than dentistry with Perry, with all the other ones. You are not the one physically working on almost any of the patients. You go, you, you go, cool, we're going to do this. You tell the assistant and they do all the work. So that's why, that's why you can see like there, there's times where we've seen a hundred patients because you're literally going in there. Cool. This is it. Assistant do it. And if you need to step in, you'll step in, but the, the assistants are doing the like, vast majority of the work. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, all right. Next question is how do you make change? How do you, make sure the changes for appearance don't affect function. The changes for appearance don't affect, don't affect function. Mm -hmm. This would be, this would be an amazing question for uh, Tao Nguyen because she's amazing <laughs> at this stuff. So how do you make sure appearance does not change function? Okay, so this is, this is interesting. This kind of goes back to, um, I have patients like this where I will, I will, tell them what I think is best and they will do something different. So there's a lot of times when say protrusion is a good example. That's the part the easiest example. When the teeth are sticking too far out um, or maybe they seem like an ideal angle. There's all these angles that you learn in ortho that seem to be ideal, which I think are 
there's like a whole nother discussion on that, which I don't know if it's hundred percent true, but there's angles that you, you're supposed to be shooting for. So you'll shoot for these angles and you'll look at the mouth and say, Hey, that looks pretty good. But then some people, some patients will tell you like, uh, -uh like this isn't good. I want to take out teeth. So for me, I'd say the function of that first bite is the best, but the patient wants the aesthetics of bringing back the teeth and keeping them, you know, making them more and more straight up and down. So in the end, can I control everything? No, like I, I don't control everything. I tell people or patients what I think is best and then they go and do whatever they want to do. And I just try to guide them and, and make it as best as possible. But is there a specific way I can make sure that the treatment is the best, absolute best for the function? Yeah, there's there's like small things you're going to test their bite and everything, but you can't really. I mean, it, we're, it's, it's weird because we're humans. We're not like robots. You know, everybody's going to be slightly different and there's no one exact. I bet you if I show this case to another, some other orthodontist, they'd be like, you should have done blah, 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 blah. You know, everybody's different. Um, yeah, so I don't think there's like one right way to do it. Yeah, for sure. So the next question is um, corporate versus owning your business. What are the pros and cons? Oh, this is a good one because I've had, I'm sure a lot of people have had this, but I've, as, as you said that, I've had the, the ability to work in a corporate, which is like Western Dental or version of Western Dental. They have like know, 400 offices. Another one who had maybe 40 offices and then obviously we started our, our one office and now we have seven and we'll probably get to quite a few more after that. So I've been through the whole thing and my wife has been through the whole thing too. I would say contrary to what pop people may tell you, I think corporate dentistry is good initially, <laughs> initially. I don't think it's good long-term because you can really just get into this, this like, you know, kind of rut of just going to corporate because it's so easy. You go there, you like on a say uh, for me, I cannot go in and clock in nine to five. Corporate, you clock in nine to five. That's legit. You get there nine, you work five or six or whatever it is, you clock out, you're gone. So that is an amazing benefit. The stress is like almost nothing. It's super easy. You're seeing patients, um, which is obviously stressful, but once it's done, the day's done, you're done. That's it. So there's orthodontists that will do that for their whole career, and that's it. And they're good. Um, the negative of that is obviously you are not the boss. You're a worker. You're an employee. You're not. A, I mean, you're a doctor, but you're you're an employee. So you have the final say, but there's a lot of people, you know, kind of guiding you through things. Um, so you, you're definitely not the boss by any means. Um, you don't really make your own hours. Like they're telling you where to work. It's harder to take off time. It's just it's everything's a little bit more difficult. You're an employee. You're just a glorified employee with a, a big degree and making pretty good money. <laughs> So that, but it's very less stressful. I think owning your own office is way more difficult, especially at the start because you don't know what the heck you're doing. You're just like praying that patients come in and praying that you can pay your bills and everything's so new. But the advantage is, um, and you'll make less money initially, which is a big thing people get afraid of. They go, hey, I'm making, you know, my hundred or 200,000 working at this corporate job. I'm going to go to my own private office and like, maybe not make anything the first year or make like 20 grand or 30 grand or whatever it is. Like I'm freaking out. So you definitely will take a pay cut initially, depending on where you are and depending on how you do your business. It may not be for that long, but you're going to take a pay cut. But in the end, financially, there's no, I mean, in all my friends' cases, everybody I know, there's no comparison. If you own your own office, you do so much better than you would in corporate financially, financially. Um, you also make your own hours like you just you for me I'm like hey I'm going to come in these times and that's it um, you can take you know you can leave whenever you want uh, a big advantage of having your own office is most time when you're not working you're still making money so that's the, you know you can be you went to Charleston we're still making money like you're still making money while you're not there um, but the downside for sure is the stress you're hiring employees there's people coming and going you got to make sure the culture is right you got to make sure you hire perfect people Gotta make sure the dentists are good, the ortho good. Like there's a bunch of different things that go along with it. But if you're looking at the pros and cons, in my mind, this is my personal opinion. My personal opinion is owning is just like, there's, it's just so much better than, than working in corporate. But corporate is nice because as soon as you get out, as soon as you get out of school, the minute you get out of school, you can work in corporate and make money. And that's important because you have lots of debt. You need to make money. 
um, yeah, so hopefully that. I know a lot of people, a lot of like general dentists, they, uh, they work for like the first couple of years and then yeah. use that money to open up their own practice. Absolutely. That's exactly what we did. We, we worked, my wife worked for a couple of years, actually in California initially, but then here in, in Dallas. And then I was still working. She basically quit her job. We opened up. I was still working like two, three days a week at corporate and then phased out of that. And it's like a very easy, natural transition. We were never like financially worried. Um, yeah, it's it great. I think and you get I, to see a little bit of the business side as well. Yeah, like when I was at corporate, I was literally trying to learn as much as I possibly could. But there's like, you just don't know anything. It's crazy how little you know. Like, you know how to move teeth. I know how to move teeth. But the business side, like, what is insurance? How does insurance work? What's a deductible? How do you send a claim? What is a claim? What's on the claim? What, you know, there's, there's just so much you don't know. And you won't know. And that's why people get afraid. And that's why I talk about this too. It's like, you can't let fear di dictate what you're going to do because everything in you is saying like, stay in this cushy job. Like it's so good. You're making money. It's not stressful. But then in the end, it's, it's, it's not like, it's not good. I don't think in the end. Yeah. Okay. So the next question is for these cases where they preserved using retainers. Um, yeah. So yeah, everybody gets retainer no matter what if you're so we've treated 70 some year olds, we've treated eight year olds, everybody gets retainer at the end and which is kind of crazy, because we treat a lot of adults and most of the adults um, have had braces before. And then when they see us or when they see me again, they're like, oh, yeah, my orthodontist told me to wear my retainer for like a year or two and then I'm good. I'm like, that was the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Like that is whoever told you that needs to be fired or let go or whatever. Because retainers is a lifelong thing. I tell everybody that retainers is lifelong. You spend a lot of time and money in order to get your smile and teeth beautiful. Like why wouldn't you just have this retainer? Like it's, it's so easy. For me, I say 12 to 14 hours every night for the first two years. And after that, it's two nights-ish a week, but forever, ever. Like I pop mine in once a week, boom, it's good. Like you're fine. And that like little piece of plastic or acrylic or whatever you have is gonna like save your $5,000 smile. Like why wouldn't you? So yes, everybody was, everybody had retainers, yes. What do you think about uh, lingual retainers? Would yeah. It, yeah. It's also I, like efficient. Yeah, I think, um, I think lingual retainers are really good. I'll give you my two cents, and this is just me. None of my friends have lingual retainers. Um, my wife doesn't, nobody I really know has lingual retainers because I think if you're gonna use a removable one, it's way better. Removable are better, but they take more work because you actually have to wear them. <laughs> Whereas right. permanent one, it's in there, it's good. You're good. You're it's good for people who forget. You get, yeah. Like lazy. Like yeah, I may or may not wear it. And it's like lingual retainer for sure. Because yeah, it's going to keep, um, keep the teeth straight. But it's way harder to brush and floss there. Tons of issues with them coming off, with bone loss, with, with tartar calculus buildup. Um, but if you're not going to wear a retainer, yeah, lingual is best. Yeah. Awesome. Um, next question is, did you ever make a mistake with the patient? And how do you prepare for that? Oh my God, I made so many mistakes. If, if, if you get somebody on here, I hope, I hope you guys know it. You get somebody on here who says they haven't made a lot of mistakes on the patient, then they're lying. So that's <laughs> um, Yeah, of course, we've all made mistakes. I mean, you know, especially when you bring in associates, that's the best time because you get a fresh pair of eyes coming in and they're kind of like, dude, like what is going on with this case? I'm like, oh crap, like this is not right. I had one that um, it was kind of a borderline case, borderline surgery, kind of like that one ladies I was showing there. Um, but the kid was kind of growing, but you're just kind of going through the motions. You don't really think of it. And then the associate comes in and she's like, yeah, this is really tough. And I was like, oh man, this is really tough. Like this is going to be a surgery case. I think in the end, this is probably like one of the worst ones. Where I was like, oh man, this is hard. Luckily, I don't remember this, but I talked to them early on about surgery. And so as we start mentioning this, they're, they're like, oh, okay. They're, you know, they're, they're okay with it. Um, so, and like this, not that type, like that's excessive, but we get those all the time where you just like do something and then later on you're like, what the heck, like that doesn't make sense. But as long as you prep the patients, that is the biggest thing. If you have that dialogue with patients, you're good. Like I, I know I say like I go in and out quick, but I always talk to the parents. I always talk to the, the kids when I'm in there and I let them know exactly what's going on. I'm like, hey, this is what we're trying to do. Even with rubber bands, like this is what we're trying to do. Or if we're taking out teeth, this is why we're taking out teeth, or this is why we might think of taking out something in the future. And I'll often say, like, if we think we're going to take out teeth, I'll probably mention it like three or four times before we actually take them out. So 
if, if you just come to the patients and you're like talking to them real and just like, this is what's going on, this is what's happening. And then something happens in the future where like, hey, I, we didn't see this or I missed this or something. People in general are like super, super forgiving. And there's like, okay, yeah, I see. Oh, because most of the time they don't see it. And then finally you tell them like, oh, I didn't really notice that. But now I get it. Like, okay, this makes sense. So I honestly think, and this was with patients, this is with probably your significant other, but with everybody, as long as you are open and you communicate really well, then patients in general, like I've never, like knock on wood, I've never had an issue with a patient like getting super angry because the treatment didn't go as expected, especially with ortho, because ortho, you can like always manipulate things. Um, so I, yeah, I think as long as you're open and, and honest, people get it. If you try to hide things, that's when I think it goes bad. I, that's, yeah, that's not good. All right. Um, someone did comment, uh, Dr. Nathan, I live in Dallas, Texas, and I'm looking for a shadow, shadowing opportunity with the dentist. Will you accept shadowers? Um, yeah, absolutely. So we, um, to be honest, I don't get many people shadow me just because I'm all over the place, but we have associates that are definitely do that. We've already had this is how it happens when you have multiple offices. You don't know exactly everything that's going on, but I know we've had people shadow with the offices and yeah, that's totally fine. Just, I'll, I'm sure my link, I don't know if you guys are gonna have my link or something in here. Um, mm -hmm. Just email me and I'll pass it on to whoever, whoever's closest. Yeah, okay, great. And then someone asked, what are your favorite types of cases? Okay, my favorite types of cases for sure I think probably most, I don't know if most ortho would say this, but my favorite types of cases, this won't make sense to you guys as much, I think, but it's it's class one. So class one is like, um, their bite is good. Like their bite looks good, they're, but their teeth are super crowded. Like they have teeth like, you know, coming out all over here, but their bite, I know may not look like it, but their bite is good. Those are the best cases because you'll probably have to take out some teeth because there's just no room for any of them but it finishes so well, like their bite and their smile just looks so pretty at the end. And it's, it, you can do it with like relatively little effort because their jaw is in the right place. And that's the biggest thing. So by far, those are my favorite. Like when I see those cases, I'm like, oh, this is gonna be so good because their teeth are so jacked up. But I'm like, this is gonna be easy. We're gonna take out some teeth and it's gonna look so good. And like the transformation from before and after is amazing. Um, yeah, so that's absolutely my, my favorite one. Mm -hmm. Um, we're going to probably take two more because we're running out of time, but what did you major in undergrad? Someone asked. I majored in bio, so I didn't have like a crazy major. I just majored in bio, um, I minored in chem, um, that was it. But I, I tell people that I don't know if it matters as much what you major in because like my classmate beside me was like an arts major. My wife's an English major. Um, mm -hmm. The other person that I was other side of my class, he was like a dental hygienist and did some random stuff before that. So I don't know if majors matter as much as we might think. I think if you could get an A in English or a C in, in like chem, you should take that English because that English is going to be, it's going to look a little bit better. Yeah, if you get like straight A's in all the toughest classes, then that's probably going to look pretty good too. But I think do the courses that you can do the best in and hopefully enjoy as well because life you have to enjoy life mm -hmm. <laughs> schools i should say like as long as you take the prereqs and yeah. uh you can major into whatever you want yeah I, I i yeah that's exactly i'm glad somebody else i'm glad that's what they're saying because that's what it seemed like on our side and when we were getting um applicants especially for ortho because that's the one i know the most when we're getting applicants in um you have to have like a certain grade to get into the interview but once you're in the interview, none of that stuff matters. Like they don't care. Like in ortho, it's like, hey, you got your grades, you got whatever to get to the interview. Now it's just like, are you cool? Like, can we hang out with you for three years or whatever it's going to be? Like, do you interact well with people? Do you like have other interests, you know? So um, yeah, getting those good grades gets you to the interview, but you have to be like an interesting person, I think, in order to, to like kind of succeed. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. All right, one more, and last one is, how do you balance your career and home or family life? So somebody told me there's no such thing as work-life balance, and I, <laughs> I do agree with that. So you guys are in the space right now where there's, sure, there's very little balance. It's like school, 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 yeah. school, 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 school. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Maybe pretty some, much. Mixed on that school, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Um, so I, I've, I've thought about this and other people have told me this too. There's such thing as work-life integration and that's what I try to do. So that means I work with my wife, number one, which is awesome. 
Um, the people I work with are amazing. Like we hire people based on how cool they are. <laughs> like they need to have the right, you know, smartness and all that stuff. But we want people who are fun to be around because nothing is worse. Like you're going to spend, well, you guys know, so you spend a ton of time on school, but for us, we're spending a ton of time at work. So you want to be around cool people. You want to be cool, like around people that are like-minded. So I tried to integrate that all um, as best as possible because I didn't, like, honestly, we work so much. Like I just would not have enough time to do everything. So well, because I'm working with my wife and, you know, we, I do work with some of my friends too. There's like a good integration there where I'm not like, oh, I'm at work. I'm missing out on like my family life. And then I'm like, oh, I'm on family. Like I'm missing out on my work life. It's like, no, it's everything's kind of integrated. Um, which does not work for everybody because some people, if you're working with your wife or significant other, it could be really tough. Um, but for me, it's, it's been great. That's awesome to hear. Uh, Dr. Nathan, unfortunately, that, it looks like that's all the time we have. It was a pleasure having you and, you know, thank you so much for being honest with us, uh, with your cases and, you know, your personal life as well. And I want to thank everyone else for uh, joining and tuning in today's session. Dia is going to go ahead and send the quiz out in our YouTube chat, but it can also be found in our link tree, in our Instagram. Everyone, please make sure to go check out Dr. Nathan's Instagram. Um, I'm not sure if you have an email, but we can, uh, we can make sure to like hook yeah. up uh, the students with that as well. But uh, on that note, I hope everyone has a great rest of their day. Thank you once again.